want to welcome those of you that are joining us online and everyone in the room. And I don't want to alarm you, but we're much closer to the season of Advent than the first of September now. <laughs> I'm sorry. Is that an alarm? Is, are you, are you, did you do your shopping yet? You should start. Did you miss Amazon Prime Days? Too late. Um, but no, it, we're really in a good spot, a turning point in, uh, in a series, a turning point in the season. The only sad part, I really love October. I love the fall in general. But I was just saying to some folks that last week on Sunday afternoon, I was walking the dog and I was taking some beautiful pictures. And you probably saw about a week ago that, I mean, trees were tr just about at their peak of brightness and still full mostly of leaves, although there's some down. Uh, but as I was walking yesterday, there's the, the same tree that was full. There's like five leaves left. What happened? It rained. Someone blew it down. I don't know what happened, but, uh, but we're at that tipping point, and that's okay. But we are in kind of a, a transition time. Back in September, when I returned from vacation, we were talking about kind of the fall and what it would look like from I love my king to I love my church, and we're still going to do those things, and we're moving into I love my city. And so perhaps on the way in, you saw and you were looking for your face? Did anyone find your face out there on the wall? Maybe uh, those of you that live within the city limits, you were like, okay, where am I on this? It's, it's not all labeled, but we want to just draw your attention to this, and those of you online can kind of point it out too. Obviously, some of us live outside of the city limits, and that's okay, but, but we have a passion for loving our community, no matter where you are, but definitely the city in which we reside. And so you're going to hear more about this. Uh, but this was an idea from, from from more than seven months ago. And the way that it started, it just seemed like a, a vision that, that I, I was gaining from, from God and, and seeing how it could be particular for, for this church, the, the whole kind of fall season. And so I shared an idea with Stephen, and I knew that Stephen would know how to bring it together, and he did. Uh, but it took a lot of us. So the pictures, I mean, that, that took Candace, and, and it took Tefera, and it took John and Stephen to take pictures. It took you getting your pictures taken, and some of you online as well. It took Tim. Henry to go and pick up the, the actual boards that we were going to put on the wall. It took Kenzie to help hold it up there. It took me to get a ladder. It took Nikki to get the adhesive. Uh, it took Blair to, actually, we didn't want Blair to lift anything. She's not supposed to right now for exciting reasons, but, um, but it took all of us to bring this together. And so when we look out there in the lobby, hopefully you realize we do love our church and the church isn't just the building that we come to on a Sunday morning or watch online, but it's, it's those faces and there's going to be more faces added to it. But isn't it cool to see that? And there's something the same about us, but there's something different about us. We all bring something to the table, and I think that's awesome. And so we do. We love our city, and I'll share more in the coming days about what this is going to mean for us, uh, but, but the spoiler prayer is going to be a big part of this. And so it's a, it's a series. It's not all in one day, um, but I want to explain a little bit of, of where we're going today. Um, back at the end of July, start of August, we had a family service on Jonah. And it was really cool in the Bible that I have up in my office. I held it open to the kids and everyone that was here. And Jonah is so short that I could open the Bible up like this and I left it open for a week straight just reading it over and over because Jonah, it's four chapters. It's 48 verses. If you put it on your Bible app or, or you were listening through or if you read it an average pace, seven minutes or so. If it took you 10 minutes, Speed up, come on, you can do it. If it's five, you're probably skimming. But the idea is that it's such a cool story and I ask the question, you know, if, if you were to Google it, what do you think if you put in Jonah and the blank, People are yelling out, whale, fish, whatever. And I said, there was actually a long list of other things that it could be. And uh, scorching east wind could be part of it today, perhaps. I thought that would be a Western spin on the series. But when we were reading it back then, there was this, this kind of sense of, of study that I couldn't get into it in full back then. But I had this sense that during, so at some point during this I Love My City series and We Love Our City, there was this context of, of Jonah going to a city. Not a city that, it was, that was his own, but this sense of caring for it. And so I want us to read the last several verses of the book itself. And uh, it's such an interesting thing where you think about Jonah and the whale, which takes up about three verses. Well, this last section, there's much more there, and it's kind of leaves on a question mark. And, and we probably have more questions than answers, but you're going to see why that is relevant. 
So picking up in verse 5 of chapter 4, then Jonah went outside to the east side of the city and made a shelter to sit under as he waited to see what would happen to the city. And the Lord God uh, arranged for a leafy plant to grow there. As soon as it spread its broad leaves over Jonah's head, shadowing him from the sun, this eased his discomfort, and Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But God also arranged for a worm. The next morning at dawn, the worm ate through the stem of the plant so that it withered away. And as the sun grew hot, God arranged for a scorching east wind, that's the western part of the movie here, uh, to blow on Jonah. The sun beat down on his head until he grew faint and wished to die. That's pretty serious, a little bit, a little extreme here. Uh, Death is certainly better than living like this, he exclaimed. Then God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry because the plant died? Yes, Jonah retorted, even angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, you feel sorry about the plant, though you did nothing to put it there. It came quickly and died quickly. But Nineveh, that's the city that he went to, Nineveh has more than 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness, not to mention all the animals. Shouldn't I feel sorry for such a great city? Father, as we just look at this for a few moments today, uh, prayer is going to be a big portion of of the next steps that you have for us. And so now we just pray as uh, you illuminate your word and and what it is that you have for us. Would you speak through me? Would you help us to understand um, something that could be so confusing yet so straightforward um, and then confusing again? Would you help us to ask the right questions and would you help us uh, to grow in caring for our community, our neighbors, uh, even our enemies? We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I love footnotes in my Bible, whether it's uh, a Bible just like this or, or on the apps. Usually there's something, and sometimes you can click on this little symbol, and it'll take you to something else maybe at the bottom of the page. And, and in this, verse 11, the very last verse of the chapter of this story and of the book, in Hebrew, the whole line about people living in spiritual darkness, well, in Hebrew it's translated, uh, people who don't know their right hand from their left. And, and I thought this is interesting. Is there any person, even one person online in the room, is there anyone that struggled or still struggles with their left and their right? Is that, is that a possibility? Like I know there's different things. It's all about perspective, isn't it? But did you ever do one of these things and you're like, which one? Now I don't mean this. Like you don't want to do that backwards either. That's, that's a different thing. We're not going to judge here, but we're not going to do that. But I, I just noticed that like when I was a kid, uh, I used to play uh, baseball, not in, in Royals Field, but in like kind of the back half. That was one of my favorite spots to play. And, and when it was my time to, to go out in the field, uh, they would send me to right field or left field but I was like, I don't know the difference. And so I would run to one of them and hope no one else was there. And so that was kind of my thing. Like when you get turned around, it's kind of like stage left and stage right. right. If, If you didn't work on the stage before, you're like, but which side? Like the side that has the drums or the side that has the piano? Anyone else struggle with that? Did anyone go to another country where they actually drive on the opposite side of the road? Have you struggled with that? I haven't ha- had to like shift gears or anything like that. It wasn't that bad, but, but I have been to one place. But I was in a place where it wasn't that they drove on a different side of the road, but the language was different. And so when I was in Italy, uh, I was able to drive there. I had this international license and uh, Carlo, uh, family friend over there, he wanted to speak to me in Italian and, and, and he gave me, uh, you know, a, a few words. And so Destra was, was, uh, was to turn right. And so if there was a fork in the road, I don't mean the Yogi Bear kind of thing of like when there's a fork in the road, take it. It wasn't that kind of thing. But it was like, you know, t- if you had to turn right, he would say Destra. But then if you had to turn left, left it was Sinistra. And so there was this concept of it, back in the day, they thought that like the left hand was, was evil where the right hand was good. And there were some things like that. Perhaps you've also heard uh, Jesus talk about this of don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing when it comes to giving a good gift. And so the right hand is typically in that culture and in, in ancient times, the right hand is the active hand 
hand. It's the one that is supposed to do good things. And so the concept there is kind of like to not let, don't, don't show your left hand, don't show your other hand when you're giving a good gift. That's kind of the context here. This one is a little different, but the idea is that they don't know the difference. They don't know if their left hand's supposed to be active, which could be evil in this context, or, or at least in spiritual darkness. There's confusion. They don't have discernment about that. And so the right hand is the one that's supposed to be active and doing good. But here, they don't even know the difference between that. And so God's kind of bringing up this, this point and leaving us on this question, leaving Jonah and the people who would then read it and discuss this later, which is now us, this question of, shouldn't I feel sorry for such a great city? Shouldn't I feel for them? They don't know the difference. Uh, they should, but they don't. And so what are we going to do about that? And I just found it so fascinating. Like right and left, uh, we were even talking about left-handed scissors this week. Does anyone have those? It depends on if you're a lefty. Any lefties in the room? A few of you, you're very creative. Uh, I think about that often of, of how, whether it's guitar or something like that, there are times where you have to switch something completely around, but you know the difference. But these people, they didn't know the difference. What Timothy Keller recognized in, in this last portion uh, of the story is that the Lord rebuked Jonah for preaching to the city without loving the city. That was the problem all along. And again, right and left, left and right, or east to west, remember what happened. The Lord had a message for this city, but he gave the message to Jonah. And Jonah was supposed to go over here, uh, just up a little bit and to the right compared to where he was from. But instead, he started heading in this direction. He's like, I don't want anything to do with that. And all of a sudden, at the end of the story, he, you know, he, the, the kind of turning point halfway through this book, uh, chapter three, he actually goes in the right direction. Finally, he takes this word. He goes to the city. And this is awesome for a preacher. If you go and you preach and people actually respond, it's like, what? They're, they're doing the thing I asked them to do. Like, this is amazing. And so, but instead, Jonah is very upset because he came and told them, like, there's gonna be destruction because of your wickedness. But what did the king do in this story? If you, if you heard way back in, in the end of July, you would have heard that the king and all the people, they decided uh, to, to basically repent. They, they decided, like, no, we're gonna, we're gonna be really strict on this. And perhaps... Perhaps God will change his mind was, was kind of their, their, their point of view. And so the, the question that, that I, I leave us with right now is that in, in this context where the Lord had rebuked Jonah for preaching to the city without actually loving it, my question for us is, how can we reach our city if we don't love our city? I think it's easy to say we love our city, but but, but how are we supposed to reach them without loving them, without truly loving them? And we're going to look at what that means in the next few weeks. But the thing about this is that Jonah was much more concerned with his prediction than the people. And I think there's a temptation, at least traditionally, of even preachers saying they're, they're more concerned with the preaching than they are with the people who are supposed to hear the preaching. And so that, that's a big uh, check for, for myself to, to make sure the motives are, are clear, that I'm not just saying, Brad, you were out of line. Like, I, I need Brad out of everyone here. Brad needs to understand the difference. It's worker. It's worker, brother. It's work. No, that's, that's meddling, and that's probably not good, and he can punch me after for that. But... But imagine in this context, Jonah was much more concerned with his prediction coming true than he was with the people. It was more about the preaching than the, pe than the people. But the city happened to respond to the message. It was the Lord's message, but it was Jonah's preaching. And so he must have been a good preacher. Something happened where there was a heart change. And so the city responded to the message Nineveh repented and the Lord relented. It's that, that fascinating word, right? And so the people were going in one direction. It wasn't, it wasn't just that Jonah had gone in one direction, but the people were going this way. And when they heard the message from Jonah, they were like, okay, we're gonna turn this way and perhaps God will change his mind. It was incredible. And God said that if they didn't, there was something that was gonna happen. It was gonna be devastating. But because they turned, God did as well. This is fascinating. God responded to the city. This is, this is a powerful moment where uh, I think the listener would be surprised that, that people that didn't know their left hand from their right, people that were wicked and doing terrible things, they had a heart change. And then God had a heart change. This is fascinating that God would respond to the city. Do you know why he responded to the city? It's because it's in his nature. 
It's in his nature to do this, and Jonah knew this. A little bit earlier, we didn't read it just a a minute ago, but I want to point out uh, just earlier in the chapter, verse 2, Jonah's angry and he's speaking to the Lord. And this highlight part that I want you to see is that he says to the Lord, you are merciful and compassionate. You're slow to get angry and you're filled with unfailing love. He's like, oh, didn't, didn't I tell you, Lord, that you were going to do this? And he's frustrated that God is good. He's frustrated that God is actually caring for these people who were wicked. And, it, and there's this confliction of there needs to be justice. And, and God is just, but he's also loving. And so Jonah is conflicted and he's mad that his prediction isn't coming true. And Jonah, he's angry about God acting like God. Isn't that interesting? And so as he says, yeah, didn't I say before I left home you would do this, Lord? It's like he's trying to, again, prove his point that Jonah is in the right. And now he's trying to say that the Lord's in the wrong for being so good. He's like, that's why I ran away to Tarshish. I knew that you are a merciful and compassionate God, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. You're eager from turning back from destroying people. He's eager. I think this actually challenges some people's view, maybe even in this room and online, of our view of the Old Testament God. Because I think we, we assume that God it simply wants to destroy everything all the time. What if that's not actually the case? What if we keep seeing throughout Scripture, throughout the Old Testament, that, that God is merciful? He is compassionate. He is actually slow to get angry. He's filled with unfailing love. He, he's eager to turn back. He might give this warning, but he actually wants people to respond, and he himself will respond. He does it time and again, but this upsets Jonah for lots of different reasons. Jonah had experienced uh, God treating him with mercy and compassion, with patience, with love. We were just singing about him bringing us up out of the clay. Well, Well, the Lord actually brought Jonah up out of the sea, up out of the mouth of this great big fish. He, there's this whole powerful thing that happens, and here God wants to do that to a city, but Jonah's upset. So I have a question for us to consider as well. Have you received, or better yet, have you experienced the Lord's mercy? What about his compassion? Have you experienced his patience? He's been far too patient with me. Has he been patient with you? Have you experienced his love? I think many of us have, and sometimes when it's time for someone else to be treated with the same thing, we don't want it for them. And I asked a question many weeks ago, if we could pray something for our neighbors, for people in our community, for people that live right next to us, what would be What could be the best thing? And now it's going to be in my wording, uh, but maybe you have different wording for it. But I thought if we could pray the best thing for our neighbors, for people in our city, in our community, wouldn't it be that they would give their entire heart, their entire lives, their whole self over to Jesus? Wouldn't that be the best thing for your neighbor? For them to experience being brought up out of the miry clay and set on a solid rock? Wouldn't it be incredible for them to experience mercy and compassion? God's patience, his love, wouldn't that be the best thing for everyone? Well, if that's true and if we've experienced it, how do we help people experience that in our city? I think our heart needs to be broken for it. I love how Jesus taught his disciples to pray and uh, there's a couple spots in, in the New Testament, but one is in the Sermon on the Mount and He's teaching them to pray our Father in heaven, right? But what I really love, and I've mentioned this a few times because I think this is gonna be more and more important in the coming weeks, is that essentially, Jesus taught his disciples to pray our Father, and you're thinking of him in heaven, right? Our Father, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so what I'm asking us to consider is to personalize it And this is why we need to. Pastor Erwin McManus, he asked this question. When have we forgotten that the church doesn't exist for us? We are the church and we exist for the world. And so my question for you is why couldn't we pray in my heart as it is in heaven? What if we could personalize it and pray in my church? That's this right here. In my church and online, it's the people. What about in our midst 
in our church as it is in heaven? What if we prayed in my city as it is in heaven? Wouldn't this prayer change everything from the inside out? What could God do if he got a hold of not only our heart, but our whole church and then our city? What could happen because of that? It's not so that the city becomes ours as though somehow it's a possessive thing like cross point, oh, Fredericton belongs to, to us in that way. Actually, the other way around, it's so that we belong to the cities in service, in healing, in care. Imagine what, what could happen if a few hundred of us and then we partner with other churches and we're loving our city like they've never seen before. It's hard to say what would happen. And so there's this other question I have. I have so many questions because I think this, this context of Jonah, it should actually leave us with more questions, more things to ponder, more things to discuss as a community than it should just simply answers. There might be something that sticks out to you, and if we were talking afterward, you might bring up a point that I didn't even realize I said it or that it was in there. And then I might bring up something else that, that's fresh, and it might be a question. Yeah, I wonder how we can relate that to our own community. I wonder how we can do this. And what if Jonah is supposed to be a question-asking kind of text? What if it's supposed to leave us asking more questions than having answers? but that the Lord himself would bring the answer as we're praying, if we, if we mean it, if we really want his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, and personalizing it in our heart, in our church, in our city, and it goes out from there. Craig Rochelle, he writ, he's written this book on leadership that as a staff, we've been discussing it. Pretty much before every staff meeting, we'll uh, see a few of the highlights from a chapter, and then there's usually great questions, either specific ones that he asks or ones that we've come up with as a staff that, that seem to address uh, where we're at and where we could be going, where the Lord's taking us. But I love this question that Craig asks. He asks, what breaks your heart, keeps you awake at night, wrecks you. I want to ask that again because this could get to the heart. It doesn't mean that every single person is on the same level with this, but, but what breaks your heart? If you think about your city, if you think about the community, if you think about your own neighborhood, whether you live outside the city or not is, is besides the point, but what breaks your heart keeps you awake at night? It's the thing that you feel like, I need to get back on my knees and pray for this thing. What, what wrecks you? What stirs you up that you need the Lord's help in? Well, what if there was something collective that, that was breaking our heart as a community? And what if it was something that, that starting with prayer, the Lord started to, to show us a solution? And what if we were part of the solution? What breaks your heart, keeps you awake at night, and wrecks you? Uh, today was one of those days, and, and the worship team's gonna come in a few moments to, to lead us in a, in a special song. And, and I say it that way because today was one of those days where I was like, I, I should have got my guitar out and just joined the band. Tyler, move over a little bit, you know? But back in the day, um, which was a Sunday, it, it was, but back in the day, A.J. Guptill and I would have been playing either the acoustic or the electric on this last song um, so many times, and I'm sure Alex played on it a few times back then as well, but we probably played it like a hundred times. And uh, it was an important one, but there's this one particular line that I want you to consider. We're gonna sing it and we're gonna worship, but I hope it also stirs you up a bit. There's this one line, and, and Brooke uh, Ligerwood uh, wrote it, and the line is this, break my heart for what breaks yours. And I think it pairs really well with the Lord's prayer as we're praying, our Father, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, we're actually asking, Lord, break my heart for what breaks yours. And when that happens, God gets a hold of your heart, you're changed, and things start to change around you. And so there's so many questions that we're left with as, as we're considering this. How can we reach our city if we don't love our city? Well, we're saying we do. We're saying we. It's not just I love my city, and you're not just saying that, but we're saying we love it. But we need to really love it. We need to love it in a way that Jesus loves his church. Keller uh, finishes uh, up the thought by saying, Jonah went outside the city hoping to witness its condemnation. But Jesus Christ went outside the city to die on a cross to accomplish its salvation. So where Jonah cared more about his prediction coming true and more about the preaching than the people, no, Jesus practiced what he preached. 
And he's the same God that he's, he's, he's slow to get angry. He's the same God that shows mercy and compassion. He's the same one that's eager to turn back, so much so that he came. And so to say it again, Jonah was outside the city waiting just to see what's gonna happen. Is God really gonna change his mind on, on this? Are the people really repentant? Are they really going to stay um, in, in, this, in this new way? Are they not going to be destroyed? But, but Jesus himself was willing to be destroyed for our salvation. That's powerful. And he tells us not just to love our neighbor as ourself, but to love each other the way that he loved us. Father, we just commit this next few moments uh, to you. And as we're praying and, and singing in this song to you, would you break our heart in the same way that, that your heart breaks for people? And would you use us as individuals, as a community, would you use us as a church to, to reach a city, but, but only as you change our hearts to, to truly love and, and to care for them. And then when there is a message specific for them that we're willing to take that, um, but not without love, it, it's, it's definitely gotta be that we're praying uh, that your will would be done in our heart first and foremost. So would that be the challenge, that starting out in our heart and in our church that uh, we're on the same page with you and then we're trusting you and, and as you want your will to be done in us, would that be a continual prayer for us? We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.